My name is Todd Johnson, and along with uh, G Dr. Gina Zerlo here, I am co-director of the Center for the Study of Global Christianity here on campus. And this is our spring forum, and we're really excited to be here, especially with uh, this fabulous subject of Christianity in Central Asia. And actually, we're celebrating a, a book launch today. This is a paperback of a hardback that was published two years ago. We actually have several authors um, or contributors to this volume here in the room. You're gonna hear from a couple of them uh, in a few minutes. And we're really excited about this. Uh, this is an affordable paperback. It's only 40 US dollars. But if you act today, you can get a copy for just $20. Um, so we're very excited about that. It's also available at christianbook.com. Uh, three of the 10 volumes in the series are available uh, also for just $23.99. So we're very excited that this is gonna get into the hands of lots of people. So thank you for coming. Um, just, just so you know, for those of you here, we have COVID protocols that we're following, try to keep everybody safe. Uh, obviously you can take your mask off to eat uh, but please put it back on when you're finished. And uh, we're not gonna be passing a microphone around. There's gonna be questions later, but you'll see we have two microphones on the floor for you to be able to come and ask questions. So uh, we invite you to do that. Just be cautious and let's uh, make this a safe event. The other thing um, I realized uh, yesterday is that talking about Christianity in Asia we have to acknowledge what's going on right around us in our country. And I was able to watch this um, podcast by our good friend, Grace Jisun Kim. She's actually the editor of volume seven of the series uh, in North America. And she did a wonderful interview with Dr. Russell Jung, who's one of the founders of Stop Asian Hate uh, out in San Francisco. And they talked about, and, and he's a, a, written a wonderful book at Home in Exile, if you haven't read that, uh, about being an Asian uh, American Christian and what that's like uh, in the United States. So um, at the end, Russell said, uh, Grace asked Russell, what, well, what should I ask my white friends and other non-Asian friends to do? And, and he simply said, see us, hear us, and share our grief. And so we want to acknowledge that at this time. Grace also wrote a very good article in the uh, Christian Century that you can look up and uh, said this is, the, this is the sort of thing that we're feeling in the Asian American community. So I know many of you are aware of this and we just wanted to acknowledge as we talk about it. And furthermore, saying that um, this statement was one that I located yesterday as well. And this is from none other than the Oregon uh, Educational Association, you know, on the other side of the country. But they say, we stand in solidarity with our AAPI community as we name these killings for exactly what they are, a direct result of our nation's long history of white supremacy, systemic racism, and gender-based violence. We recommit ourselves to our efforts to become an institution that addresses issues of equity and racial justice at every turn. Really beautifully stated. And of course, we have a strong biblical basis for thinking like this and seeing that sin is not just an individual matter. It can make itself uh, into systemic problems. Uh, and we want to uh, stand with the Asian American and Pacific Islander community at this time, even as we talk about what's happening uh, in Central Asia. So just thought that that would be a good way to begin. And I'm gonna ask our, our president, Dr. Scott Sunquist, who um, to come up and just say a greeting and open us in prayer. And uh, Dr. Sunquist knows something about Christianity in Asia, so please don't recount the entire history. Just, just a short <laughs> greeting will be nice. Thank you, Todd, uh, for the introduction, the reminder that we are in a context, in a particular context now. And at Gordon-Conwell, we try to pay attention to what's going on in the world, as well as in our community. And uh, <clears throat> this is an exciting time for me. Um, I met one of our speakers here this morning, 
and all of a sudden all these things flooded back in my mind just about how Gordon Conwell, uh, I studied with Chris, J. Christie Wilson, and he talked quite a bit about Christian witness uh, in Asia, but especially in South Asia and Central Asia, and fired up in me a commitment uh, for Asia at that time. Um, I thought it would be appropriate not only to welcome everybody here today, but to use a prayer an early Asian prayer for Lent uh, that has become fairly famous in both the Catholic as well as in the Orthodox tradition and hopefully more in the Protestant tradition uh, from one of my favorite saints. I guess we all have our favorite saints, right? Um, and that's Saint Ephraim, uh, the Syrian. So I'd like us to pray. I'm going to read it twice because oftentimes brief prayers are meant for meditation. So I'm going to read this twice. Uh, let us pray. O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, despair, lust of power, and idle talk. But give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to thy servant. Yes, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own transgressions and not to judge my brother or sister. For blessed art thou unto ages of ages. Again. O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, despair, lust of power, and idle talk. But give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to thy servant. Yes, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own transgressions and not to judge my brother or sister. For blessed art thou unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay, um, before we listen to um, our uh, speakers about the uh, book that we're celebrating, I wanted to sneak in an advertisement for a course that is going to be offered next year. This will be the third time that uh, we've had a Gordon Conwell uh, Global Education course in Uzbekistan. And uh, I just want to give you 13 reasons why you should go, okay? Um, First of all, this was not planned. Actually, Elizabeth, she's going to be talking to us. Do you remember this? Elizabeth and Travis and I did not plan to coordinate with this unfinished um, minaret but we, in, in uh, Kiva, but we managed to, to do that. So 13 reasons. Okay, the tea is awesome in uh, Uzbekistan. You need to go just to drink tea every single day. And we do go to tea houses uh, constantly. Um, we also uh, eat tremendous amounts of fantastic food uh, of all different kinds. And we're there in May and June, so there's fresh fruit, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, we can we barely keep up, it's really wonderful. It's easy to make friends everywhere we go. We get to talk to people and make friends. We uh, listen to fantastic music and dance, do a little bit ourselves uh, as we're able. And the tiles and the pottery are uh, uh, unmatched anywhere. Um, so we're really happy about that. And then we visit some really exciting uh, places. Samarkand, this, I took this picture myself. It's just uh, remarkable, the beauty there. And as a group, here we are in Red Registan. This is the 2018 group. Um, and if you don't like daytime, there's the nighttime. Okay, you can go and enjoy that. Um, then we also go to Bukhara and have a, a wonderful visit there. And did I mention there's a lot of really great food? And this is actually in the city square. Been there a couple thousand years and you're sitting next to the water. It's just uh, magical. Uh, and if that isn't enough, here's Kiva. That's where the uh, unfinished minaret was. And um, again, more eating, more wonderful food and uh, things you can buy. Um, and then we take you out in the desert just so that you can ride a camel and enjoy that. And you can spend a night in the yurt as well. 
um, even reading about the Silk Road in front of the yurt. We also go from there over the mountains into the Fergana Valley. And that's a really spe a special part of the trip. And then when you just can't take any more excitement, we fly to Istanbul for breakfast, okay? It's overnight. And our hotel is right there between the Hagia Sophia and the Blue Mosque. And we spend uh, three days there, kind of debriefing. We're still on the Silk Road. Uh, and it's really fabulous. It's 20, 20 days or so, um, this trip. But the main reason we go is because Christianity is an Asian religion. And we want you to see uh, what it's like. And, and of course, the history, this is, these are Sogdian merchants. I think I took this picture in the uh, Afro Sayab Museum in Samarkand. And it's just a reminder of, of uh, the history of our religion and uh, who we are. Okay, and here's, if you, if you want to find out more about the trip, there's a page uh, there which's really inexpensive compared to a lot of trips that are taken. This includes the airfare all the way through from, from Istanbul to Tashkent and all the way back. And, and all the food, too. Food is really, did I mention the food? It's just really, really great. So we want to encourage you to come. And I know you don't believe me because I'm leading the trip, so I brought one of uh, our, my former students here to give you her testimony, and she took this beautiful picture. Elizabeth Fortcamp is going to give a testimony. All right. Well, hi. So yeah, Uzbekistan. Amazing, right? So Dr. Johnson asked me to talk, and I was like, well, how do you convince a room full of strangers of something that they might want, but you know that they really should want more? So academically, I can tell you that a trip like this will help you experience the richness of life, but to know in our Western definition is insufficiently defined. But to know in Eastern thought entails experiential knowledge and tangible knowledge, and that's what you get on a trip like this. So what shall I tell you of? Pondering this question, myriads of memories flooded to mind. Should I tell you of early morning sunrises over the Hagia Sophia, or of evenings around the campfire as Bedouins sang lullabies? and Italian tourists attempted to teach us songs we never mastered before we sank under the heaviness of camel's hair blankets in our yurts. Should I tell you of the courtyards, some filled with pottery and scars and all manner of exotic goods, some with gardens and families whose smiles lit their homes with a warmth we may never know? Should I tell you of the tombs that mark this country, long tombs, glittering tombs, dark and solemn tombs, Tombs with faces etched into them so the dead can see their visitors. Should I tell you of the rhythmic cooling and pouring of the tea? Or the blue chinaware of Osh, of wheels of bread? Should I tell you how we searched high and low for iPhone ice cream bars? Should I tell you of the cold austerity of the Soviet presence? Or the warm Uzbek rebellion as it delves into myths and superstitions? Should I tell you of the roads? Roads that have been arteries of life for millennia. Should I tell you that Louisa's Fitbit registered 10,000 steps before 10 a.m. when riding on these roads? Or let you find out? Should I tell you to look out across the fields that drained their sea to find the people bent, working, straining to produce something from an inhospitable land? Would you see them slowly walking up those long straight lines of road if not? Should I tell you of the people who crowd around wanting photos? Ought I tell you that you will mutually marvel at one another? Should I tell you of the tile, of silk, of spices, of coffee art, of Persian wisdom, of carpets, of wood carvings, of trades handed down for centuries? Should I tell you the hospitality, the kindness of strangers, of their desire to include everyone to the extent that old men come to stand guard next to vans to watch over young Americans lest they feel lonely, and grandmothers come to bring their grandsons to lick their ice cream cones next to a solitary stranger on the steps of a mosque so they would not stick out. Should I tell you of the beautiful children, of their happiness, of their poverty, of their families, of their smiles? Perhaps not. For the story I want to tell you comes in the white heat of the afternoon sun. It comes with exhaustion. Picture it. You're at a mausoleum, but perhaps you are tired of graves. 
Perhaps you are thirsty, but it's Ramadan. Perhaps you are tired from walking and walking and touring. Perhaps you are tired from digesting your huge lunch of ash or samosas or kebabs or tea. You climb out of your air-conditioned van, but the vents hadn't worked quite as well as you were entitled to them working. Within this mausoleum, there's a groundskeeper. He's been fasting since daybreak. He's old, perhaps 70 or 80. He's tired. But when you enter, he immediately welcomes you, though he speaks no English. And as you take his place in the shade, you watch as he jabs a pole into his apricot tree to bring down fresh fruit for you to enjoy. Sweat pours down his face, but it is wreathed in smiles, overjoyed to share his best with you, a stranger he will never meet again. That is the heart of Uzbekistan. It is customary there to express one's thanks by placing your hand over your heart as if to say thank you. You have touched my heart. And so it did. And so it does. So thanks. You should go. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth, for such a vivid experience of what it's like to be in Uzbekistan. My name is Dr. Gina Zerlo. I'm the co-director of the Center for the Study of Global Christianity. And before we get to our esteemed guests, I just want to give you a little bit of an overview from the center's perspective, because what is an event from the center without numbers and maps and charts and graphs? If you know us, this is what we do. So here are some of the maps and charts from the, the volume that Dr. Johnson spoke of that is for sale out there. And this is an overview of the South and Central Asia region, and this is a map that shows majority religion by province, or by state as we understand it here. And the darker the color, the higher concentration of that religion. So you see most of Central Asia is majority Muslim, and then as we move into India, we have majority Hindu. Um, there are some majority Christian places uh, here and there, but I want to focus on Central Asia, which is the region that we are discussing today. Here are the five countries of Central Asia shaded by the percentage Christian. And you can see quickly that Christianity is a minority religion in this region. Uh, most countries are less than 10% Christian, uh, the exception there being Kazakhstan. And many of these Christian communities in these countries struggle to retain members. Christianity in Central Asia is a largely Orthodox tradition. Um, and the Orthodox, though, have been declining with the exodus of Russians from the region after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. So this region has experienced a tremendous amount of change uh, since the early 90s. And one of those changes is the decline of Christianity overall. So Christians in the region declined from 12% in 1970 to 8% in 2015. And there are still a lot of limitations on personal freedom in many of these countries, which make it difficult for religious minorities, including Christians, to practice their faith and, of course, share their faith. And the last thing I'll show you is this is the change of the Soviet to post-Soviet time. If you look at religions from 1970 to 2015, you can see that atheists and agnostics held a lot of the population in Central Asia due to the Soviet influence. And then after the fall of the Soviet Union, we have a drastic reduction in the non-religious population and massive growth of Islam, uh, reclaiming Islam as a national religion of sorts. So that's just a brief overview of um, Christianity in Central Asia from a demographic perspective. And now I am thrilled to invite our first speaker to, uh, to the podium. Uh, Baruch Atulo Ashurav is teaching at Boston College and specializes in the languages and religions of pre-modern Central Asia, particularly those of the Sogdians, who lived in modern-day Tajikistan and Uzbekistan from the 5th to 11th centuries. His courses at Boston College give students the opportunities to cover topics that are rarely covered, such as the politics of Tajikistan, Zoroastrianism, and Sogdian sociolinguistics. So we are really, really lucky to have Barak Atula with us today. So please, let's welcome him to the podium.
Thank you so much for your kind introduction and invitation to be here today. And I think that um, uh, Dr. Johnson and we all, I think uh, there is a congratulations due for this uh, lightweight paperback of this volume because this means that now it would be easier and lighter to carry it when you go, you know, because this is a, a fantastic volume that came out. And um, <clears throat> I wanted to focus on the uh, Christianity in Tajikistan and as already the demographic data that has shown. And I think uh, as the year after year it goes, I think those data keeps shifting and changing and the uh, unreliability of the official statistics that the government provides that kind of hampers, you know, accuracy of our information. However, in the view of the, uh, in the, view of the uh, low unemployment and the other economic reasons that um, makes, you know, uh, either Russian ethnic Orthodox Christian to leave or the local, uh, ethnic Christians to leave due to the various reasons. So we also are witnessing that there are an ethnic Central Asian community, you know, Christian communities growing outside their homelands, which I think that probably in the addition, another edition of this volume, we will also consider to add that uh, because that is a new dynamics that we are witnessing that as uh, uh, the major uh, able men from Central Asian countries, either Tajikistan or Uzbekistan, as they travel to other CIS countries you know, um, in the region and some European countries. And uh, given the relative freedom and being a distance from home and not being under a, the social pressure that otherwise is present in the home countries, so the, you know, the uh, process of, uh, for them to um, coming to faith is much easier. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, historically, as um, already was mentioned, that Christianity is the Asian religion. However, despite the fact, you know, that Christianity came to Central Asian region and uh, um, long before even it came to Europe, yeah, but today, uh, the country of Tajikistan as well as Turkmenistan that I brought, I provided the data for this volume, they are 90% Muslim. And uh, what would be the reasons that we have uh, numerically low? So there could be, you can find a historical reasoning from the past and you know that there are historical reason, but then there is also a side to the historical reason also there is a a cultural or, uh, or a political reason that uh, is uh, provided by the isolation that the countries of Central Asia had, both starting from the, you know, that from the 15th to 19th century and then after the Russian occupation and then, then followed by the Soviets. So this isolation that meant that they had to, you know, they, they, they had to be contained in whatever form of the religiosity that they had. Although Islam always went down, but never was uh, eliminated. And in similar manner, we can see that certain Christian um, groups in Tajikistan survived from the Russian imperial period, and they still continue, but then some of the new movements are, that are coming. And in the view that the politically, as the government doesn't allow registration, Although that there outlines the criteria according to which you can register a group or you can hold a meeting, you know, religious meeting, still we have no data since 2000, you know, for the past 20 years, if any Christian group has officially got registered. We know, however, of the Christian groups that have been outlawed and, you know, uh, that they were. Um, uh, announced as uh, to be illegal. And this condition that it means that the nature of Christianity in uh, Tajikistan or in Central Asia, by large in some cities, are going back to the pattern of the early Christianity in its homeland in Mesopotamia. They are going now into the homes, you know, the, the, the home groups and home churches. And, and one thing is that just as uh, because of the, uh, the security and also because of this is not official data, so you cannot count exactly and you cannot quantify the number of these 
you know, the, the home groups and the number of believers. But we do believe that in the near future, as there would be more progress in democracy and human rights, so we believe that then we can come up with a more accurate data. But for today, the situation as I departed, you know, left Tajikistan in 2017 and we're still in touch. So the situation remains unchanged and more and more people as they leave the country so then it means that the p population of Christianity is shrinking. But then I think that given the context where we are now for the learners, you know, that for people documenting the history of Christianity, it remains crucial that we have to keep documenting it. Because of in the longer run, this would be the data that, that can show us, you know, that this will become a very important data to show the, the testimony of the uh, resilience and the prevalence of our faith or of Christian faith in this uh, uh, part of the world. But thank you and I'm very happy about this, um, the new edition of the book and I would be happy if there would be any question that afterwards would be available to answer. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take questions at the end. So I'm delighted to welcome our second guest, who is Feruza Krazen, and she holds a Master of Arts in Biblical Languages from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in South Hamilton, Massachusetts. She is a Bible translation consultant with SIL Eurasia Area and was one of the mother tongue translators of the Uzbek Bible. So thank you, Feruza, for being with us. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> Dr. Sanquist, we have to get an Uzbek flag up there. Oh. I've been lobbying for 15 years, so maybe this will shame you into it. <laughs> Uzbeks are terrible. We shame everything, everyone into doing things. Um, Uzbekistan, it's the um, land of the plenty, as um, Dr. Johnson said and as many can testify. But it is a land that is thirsty and hungry for the King of Kings and for the righteousness that he brings. There are many people in Uzbekistan who hunger, truly hunger for God. When the Soviet Union fell apart, many people didn't have an identity anymore, so they grasped Islam as their identity. And so many, many more people started uh, praying the five and daily prayers, the namaz, and claiming Islam as their religion. And it also showed us how hungry people are. And many people came to Uzbekistan to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And churches started being planted. And those churches today, I am so happy to tell you, are thriving. In Uzbekistan, um, with the political change that has happened in the last four years, um, churches now, ethnic Uzbek churches, uh, can be registered. As of last year, there are 13 ethnic Uzbek churches that are registered. And um, daily we hear of people coming to Christ. And as we know, um, it's in Muslim countries, before you commit your life to Christ, you have to count the cost. You have to think of the ramifications of the denial that will be yours. Your family will deny you. Your family will disown you. So as a church, we have to become a community, a true community. And the Uzbek church is fulfilling that. The Uzbek church is an example of what, means, what it means to be a family of Christ. There are, just in the last year, um, I have heard of more than 600 Uzbeks coming to Christ and more than 100 baptisms. These are just some pictures to show off Uzbekistan. Um, this is something I wanted you to see. So these dear people, I was in Uzbekistan for three months, um, just a couple months ago. These are the people 
that I am looking at and going, what happened to us? We were all students in 19 and 20 when we became believers together. This is my first church. We got together again, and what a joy it was to see everyone, um, how everyone has been faithful through trials and tribulations, through loss of family and friends because of their faith, through just problems of health, persevering and trusting in God, sharing each other's tragedies, but also sharing our joys, trusting that the God we serve is a God who makes the valley of grief and despair a door of hope. That's the God we serve, and that is the God who's at work in Central Asia. This is one of the churches that has been registered in Uzbekistan. They meet right now, they meet at my sister's house. My brother-in-law is a pastor. But this is, when I say one of the churches, this is one of the groups of the churches not more than 10 people cannot get together still because of the old law is not in effect, but it's, the new law is not understood yet. So if you gather more than 10, 15 people, the police can still come and raid your um, church and take you to the police station and fine you and all of that. But people get, get together, and this is just part of the church. And there's a church that meets on Friday evenings. There's a church that meets on Saturday afternoons. There's a church group that meets on Sunday afternoons. And these are the people who ha were brave enough to give their signature. They're, they needed to collect more than 100 signatures to register one church. They were brave enough to give their name, their address, so their church could be registered. They are now looking forward to buying a building so they can do more as a group. These people are so brave, so courageous as they proclaim the name of Christ. Just recently, um, well, COVID situation, right? What happened economically, you all know what happened. But places like Uzbekistan, where economy is already in dire state, people were hungry. People didn't have enough to eat. People didn't have enough to drink in some places. And so the church rallied together. They brought food for the people. They brought whatever medicine, they, whatever they needed. They were able to bring to people who were sick and hungry and truly witness for Jesus. They even in the midst of it, they went and built a playground for one of the neighborhoods. And they were featured on TV by the Uzbek um, TV channel because they're just, they're doing all of this for no money. And like, how can you do something without, you know, for, not for profit? They are there bravely proclaiming Jesus. And because of this, people are attracted to them. Because of this, people ask them about their faith. And because of this, the church now is growing. There was a big flooding, um, a reservoir, a dam broke. And um, there's lots of Uzbeks are compassionate people. Everyone gave whatever they could, mattresses and clothes. And the church wasn't idle. The church went and they gave food, they gave shelter. And even now, when a lot of people have forgotten, that's what happens in a tragedy, doesn't it? Isn't it? We go, at first we rally, we help, but then we forget to follow up. The church hasn't forgotten, and people see that. Church members still go to this place where people haven't been provided with a home yet, and they are still following up. They're still preaching Jesus, but they're also clothing them. They're feeding them. And this is a true evidence of true love. And so more and more, as more and more people are coming to Christ, as more and more people are being baptized, I was so honored to be able to baptize several people. Um, and this is people who have come to the Lord just in the last year. And it's happening in the bathtub because um, it was too cold to go out to the river. And I got to do be a part of it because... Men and women are um, baptized separately when it's in close quarters like this. So it was my privilege to be able to be a part of the baptism of this 16-year-old girl and of another woman who is 60, a middle-aged woman. There were about eight women who wanted to be baptized because they want to show people their faith. 
And this is um, just, the, I'm talking about the Uzbek ethnic people that, um, there's another great awakening going on in Uzbekistan right now. And this is among the people that we know, um, normally know as gypsies. They call themselves the Mughals, or Romas, some you know, call them. Um, but in Uzbekistan, they call themselves the Mughals. This Korean brother one day invited um, a, a Mughal person who was there to, for asking for something. Asked him, do you want to read about this God who loves you? And the Mughal says, you want to talk to me? Nobody wants to talk to them. Nobody wants to spend time with them. Nobody wants to share a meal with them. But the brother said, yes, I do. And so he started reading the Bible with him once a week. The next time he brought his family, his, bro um, his wife and his children and the Korean brother who had just learned Uzbek, he says, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. So he invited other Uzbek brothers and sisters to come join this ministry. And now, among this people group, there's an awakening. There's a church being planted, and there are Uzbek ministers who are being called to go and serve among them. There's the story after story of how God is working among them. There's one Mugat brother telling, is telling a story. So he said, we are one of the families of our um, group who are lucky enough to have a car. So we go around and gather plastic bottles, recyclables to sell back. One day, his car got stuck on an incline in the mud. He said, I knew I shouldn't have gone out, but I needed to go and make money. So his car got stuck. But this brother had just become a believer. So he said, I was going to die there because it was so cold, he and his wife in the car. And he said, but you know what? I knew that I'm, the God that I believe in is strong enough and mighty enough, and I know his angels obey him. So I just said, God, please help me. Help me to get my car out. And he said, you will not believe, but the angels picked up my car, slowly backed out of that ravine, and put me back on the road. I mean, this, this sounds like a legend, but he is telling the truth. He says, this is what's happening among us. And then there's another Mugat brother. He says, there are four of us. We're driving down, and just we had a big, huge sack of plastic bottles. And um, we see there's some people, Uzbek men, whose car was broken down. He says, so we said, you know what, we should stop. God tells us we should help everybody. They're probably going to think that we're going to rob them, but we're not. We're just, we want to help them. And so they stopped, and they said, what do you need? And they're just like, well, what do you want from us? And so we just want to help. I'm like, really? Like, how can you help? We want to help fix your car. Why? Because we want to. Uh, and um, so the Uzbek guy said, okay, sure. And so they helped him fix the car, and somehow, and... He said, look, okay, here's some money. And he said, no, 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 we don't want your money. He said, what? You're gypsies and you don't want money? Nope, we don't want money. What do you want? We just want you to say, thank you, Jesus. And the guy's like, what? And he said, we just want you to say, that's your thanks. You have to say, thank you, God. Thank you in Jesus' name. And the guys are like, are you crazy? And he said, no, we serve a mighty God who came to save us from our sins through Jesus Christ. And that's who you, we want you to thank today. And these Uzbek guys have just said, okay, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. And the Mugat brother said, that's all we want. We just want the name of Jesus to be glorified, no matter where we are and no matter how. So they are being a tremendous witness for Jesus. And this is just shows us that even though the church seemed dead, the Eastern church that was vital at one point, that was thriving and growing, it seemed dead. But God is powerful, and God is at work. The church is not dead. There may have been one or two believers throughout the decades during the Soviet Union, Uzbek believers. There were many Russian believers. But you know, by um, now... They say there's a study done several years ago that over, there are over 10,000 Uzbek believers now. So when I was in Uzbekistan, I attended one, a small church group, and as I was sharing with them, I said, that's what they said. They said there are close to 10,000 
Um, or over 10,000 Uzbek believers, and one brother says, well, yeah, those are the ones who are brave enough to say they are. Just in my region, there are over 5,000. Like, how, how do you know? And he said, well, I know people. He's a builder, and he travels. And um, So we can look at numbers. I'm grateful for numbers because it gives us perspective. But we need to also know that there are brothers and sisters who are not counted in our eyes yet, but they're counted in the eyes of the Lord. And the church is growing. The church is not dead because God is at work. And there's story after story I could tell you. And that's what Central Asians do. We just tell stories. And so, <laughs> um, but this, I'm just grateful that to be here and to be a witness for you of how God is at work and how nothing stops him from working and multiplying his body and extending his kingdom. The church is growing. In 1994, when I became a believer, I think maybe there were, that I know of in the capital, there were maybe a hundred of us, but now there are thousands, thousands and thousands of people. So sometimes when I feel alone, sometimes when I feel discouraged, is anybody doing anything? I think of these brothers and sisters who are out there making other people say, thank you, God, in Jesus' name, <laughs> even when they don't know who Jesus is. They're, they're out there. And most importantly, God is out there. The Holy Spirit is out there. He's within us, but he's also out there working, making sure that the name of Jesus is being proclaimed. And soon, come Lord Jesus, right? Soon, we will see the fruit of our labors. Now, I'm just so glad that um, I can be here and be a witness of God's goodness and his grace and his faithfulness for you all today. So thank you, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Zerlo, for inviting me. I Thank just have some, Risa. sorry, um, just some pictures here um, to show you. I thought these would be fun, but Dr. Johnson's going to show you an amazing thing. You all go and experience this. Pictures show us, but when we experience all this personally, it's so much more powerful. Yeah, go eat some yummy food. <laughs> the bread is unparalleled. All right. Well, there's more pictures. I didn't realize how many pictures I put on there. But anyway, please go to Uzbekistan and meet some of these lovely brothers and sisters and experience Uzbekistan, but most importantly, experience God and what he's doing there and what he has been doing for the past hundreds of years. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Farisa. So at this time, we're going to have a question and answer time. And we have two microphones in the center uh, in, of the aisles there. Uh, for COVID restrictions, don't touch the mic. Just speak into the mic. And we can also take questions from anyone watching online on Facebook Live. So if you want to create a socially distanced line at either of the uh, microphones, we can start with questions. Thank you all for sharing. <clears throat> I'm curious, um, in Central Asia, for the churches that are growing, I guess this could be addressed to any, any panelists, um, which Christian denominations are having the most success? Um, if the Eastern Orthodox are shrinking, which churches are kind of picking up that slack? I can speak for Uzbekistan. Um, there is a, a very strange yet, but unique union of the Uzbek evangelical churches. Uh, many pastors from many denominations are represented there. And this is the question I asked when I was there just um, in the fall. I said, what denomination is growing? And this one um, brother said, 
we all have our little denominations, Baptists and Pentecostals and Charismatic, but we don't focus on that. It's just mostly pastors who care about it. But most people, uh, lay people, don't even know what denomination is. They just say, hey, do you speak in tongues? No. Oh, you're from that church. Yeah, OK. So. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, the, the Eastern Orthodox, the, the Russian Orthodox Church was never actually too involved in evangelism. And so people who attend the Orthodox Church are mostly Russian people. And the um, Uzbek churches, they do have denominations, but they're not as prominent as they are in the West. Yeah, I think that I can add that. Um, the question of the, which denomination is growing um, uh, wouldn't, it is difficult to respond. There are certainly a representative of major Christian denominations present in Tajikistan, as you would just think, you know, I just out of my head, so there are probably representative of more than <clears throat> 10 different denominations. But however, in the view of the uh, political climate, so most of these uh, uh, workers from these denominations, they have to partner with the locally registered churches and so largely, they uh, either they work with the <clears throat> evangelical uh, Baptist church or uh, evangelical Tajik church. And so and then they would have their own, obviously. I think uh, in the sight of the uh, government, as they don't distinguish you know, theologically if this is uh, a full gospel Pentecostal or if this is, uh, you know, a, a Southern Baptist. So all of them, they just, they see them as a Christian. But it is only internally that some Christians then they would um, uh, differentiate themselves that, oh, you know, like we are from this church and, you know, by, based on their practices. But I think that growth across the, any denomination is very, very slow in a sense that because of the knowing that the risk and another part of that for Tajikistan more than 80 percent of population they still live in the rural areas in the villages and reaching out to people in the village context is much harder than for cosmopolitan you know the, the city people and so therefore that is also part of the process why it is slow and not growing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, presentations. I have two questions. Uh, first question is, how do Christians in Tajikistan or Uzbekistan, how do they think about the pre-modern history of five or six hundred years of Christianity. What do they think about it? The fact of the Sogdian Christianity or the Silk Road Christianities, what do current Christians think about that? I think that it is, <clears throat> if taking it from the perspective of the uh, Christians, they are very excited, knowing that they have a history, particularly thinking that against the prejudice, the social, you know, cultural prejudice that is, uh, uh, you know, prevalent in, in the country that, you know, that you are just, uh, you know, like, uh, you don't know your history, you know, like, and your, your, all your history has been, you know, Muslim, but now you're Christian, so this is bad, and so and so. But for many people, knowing that history, for especially Christians, it is encouraging. But on the other hand, uh, purely, like, from my own experience, I can say that purely um, in the government or even in academic level, for many of them, it is that they would say that, you know, um, uh, the debate, the, the debate on that, that the Christians that will hear, you know, that they will probably, and maybe the uh, traveling community, you know, like the merchants that came and they stayed here, and, uh, you know, we cannot prove whether they are, you know, like genetically with the local people or not. So they, the, on one side, the official academy is in denial. But then overall, you know, specifically as my, uh, 
you know, work related to uh, studying the uh, uh, heritage of the Sogdian Christians. So I can say that for many believers, it has been, you know, there with uh, excitement looking that, you know, that we have had, you know, people living here that they had access to Bible already in the fifth century, you know, and it was translated already in a local language. Because throughout, even in a modern period, you know, the uh, Bible was accessible in Russian and then later, you know, that from the 80s on, then they started translating it into a uh, local Tajik language, so. Um, in Uzbekistan, uh, Christians are certainly excited as they read more about the um, history of the church, especially the Eastern Church. Um, in our uh, Uzbek Bible app recently, just last year with the um, help of um, Dr. Mark Dickens, um, our Uzbek team was able to write um, an article called The um, Ancient History of the Church, uh, uh, Christian Church in Central Asia. Um, and we put it in the app, in the Bible app. Many Christians are excited to share the story that we are not displeasing our ancestors um, and, and ancestral spirits, but we are returning to them. Um, so as they hear more, of course, as Barakatullah said, um, Christians are validated and they're excited, but Muslims say that we're all lying um, and that uh, we should not be polluting the people's minds. Um, but it's exciting. There's um, lots of research being done, um, and there are some articles and books being written, uh, and hopefully it will help our brothers and sisters in their um, efforts of evangelism. Thank you very much. My, my second question is, uh, what roles do you think the uh, Christian community outside of Central Asia has today in the life of the Christian church in Central Asia? That is a very difficult question to answer because there is no one answer to it and there is not also an easy answer to it. But I mean, in a view that, you know, one thing is that <clears throat> uh, for the, like, um, the Communion of believers, let us say, the communion of believers, and as a part of the body of Christ worldwide, that is important that the Christians worldwide, irrespective of the nationality, the language, the race, the economic and social status, they have to maintain that uh, communion based on their faith. But when we're talking about Central Asia, it partially it becomes, you know, that they the one problem is obviously the um, that say um, uh, inter, inter intercultural understanding of faith. You know there are I I do know that there are a great number of uh, believers you know outside Tajikistan in in North America or in Europe that they are very knowledgeable of Central Asia, but then there are also many that they don't know. And I think that, you know, that one way of support would be that, you know, that to increase more, you know, that um, uh, proficiency among the Christians in North America and Europe in terms of that, how to better communicate they, you know, with Christians there. You know, that finding that, um, but then also the second is also the sensitivity of, uh, whether our support or you know directly being in touch in any way will you know um, uh, undermine the security or the safety of the other person, but then also you know in terms of uh, I think uh, supporting through the educational initiatives I think is something that it is much needed, in a sense that the collapse of USSR opened the borders and then the missionary forces could come in, you know, that and work and then they, uh, but still, you know, having um, a Bible schools mm -hmm. in local languages that are adequately equipped, you know, with uh, uh, reading resources and books is still, you know, a, a big uh, lacuna. So I think that that would be something that's supporting sort of the educational initiative so that for people to be able to, you know, have access to educational resources and study there. Because for many, you know, like myself, 
being involved with education. So I know that many of us that we send our local believers outside our country for education, and then it happens that after they spend three or four years there, and they, you know, in their mindset, everything becomes switched to that. And then when they come back, so it takes them another five years for them to kind of transit mm -hmm. from um, the context where they studied so that they can switch to the ministry. So therefore, I think through the local educational initiative, this would be a biggest support and help. And that was one of the biggest um, uh, impacts that the um, foreigners had, foreign brothers and sisters had in Uzbekistan by establishing Bible schools and seminaries um, and by transferring leadership and training to the local people. Because if they hadn't been wise enough to do that from the beginning, when everyone had to leave in 2005, between 2005 and 2008, the whole system would have collapsed if they had not transferred leadership and teaching um, positions. But because they did that, because they were wise enough, uh, the, those Bible schools are still in Uzbekistan, Bible schools, um, and seminaries are still continuing to teach the local believers and the leaders. I'm sure some do still go out because you do need a little bit higher level education and they do go out, but lots and lots of people are being trained um, online now. They're distance learning, distance education, and um, they're uh, just most of the churches are grateful that uh, in Uzbekistan in particular, that when foreign brothers and sisters came to tell about Jesus, they didn't impose their Western uh, ideas and Western culture and Western way of thinking. And this is one of the biggest reasons that the Uzbek church has thrived is because we have been able to adapt um, our culture into the biblical one. We didn't try to become Western because that just for Uzbeks, that's so, they equate Christianity with Russian already, with Russian culture. But um, when they saw that they can worship in Uzbek, they can sit on the floor and they can write their own worship music, it's, it, it enabled and empowered um, the, the Uzbek believers. And so, Maybe that is just the with empowerment and an enablement of the local people by, yes, sure, people need money and people need education, people need help. And most often it's to go and ask the local people what it is they need. And even, you know, Christians, we in Uzbekistan, especially I know in Asia, we need to learn transparency and to help, to help with that. The, you know, Asians are all about fa saving face and, so, and, and not feeling shame. Um, so uh, to help um, culturally to learn from the Uzbek church, but to also help them of biblical values um, that, wouldn't, that, that are um, applicable in our culture and that doesn't destroy our culture. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a question from our live stream from Jason Casper with Christianity Today. What can you tell us about the history of the church in Kazakhstan and its current situation in terms of religious freedom and church growth? You're going to have to read this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think that if the, it concerns Kazakhstan, I think that Kazakhstan is among one of the unique countries in a Central Asia with the relative freedom that it has. And, uh, and being kind of joined to, say, Russia during the imperial period and the Soviet, so it is a country that uh, they have a less uh, values in traditionalism. 
the you know most recent uh, uh, reverse in the cultural orders in Kazakhstan in terms of the Kazakh identity, changing the orthography and you know establishing that you know that everything should be Kazakh obviously makes it uh, very different. But uh, given that it had much more freedom than say Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, or Turkmenistan, so the church in Kazakhstan is in relative growth, and especially. Um, Kazakhstan is uh, has a less, say, uh, rural settlements. So largely because of the cosmopolitan and people live in the city. So the development in Kazakhstan is very different. But yeah, but the the data I think in the book shows that much more, uh, you know, uh, information on that. In the former Soviet republics, um, we talk about Russification. Um, so Uzme Uzbeks and Tajiks and Turkmens were less Russified than the Kazakh and the Kyrgyz people. Um, and that may have helped with uh, the, the growth of the church and uh, the less hostility that they experience. Thank you. There are any other comments from our panelists before we close for today? No. Thank you. Thank you. Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, at this time, we'll have Todd Johnson come up and close out our time together. All right, well, thank you all for coming. It's uh, good to see many familiar faces here, some who were on uh, previous Silk Road trips with us. So um, we'd like to encourage you to take a look at www.globalchristianity.org. We're continuing to put more um, items there for you. In fact, I don't know, we don't have our latest infographic yet, but we just did a brand new infographic, which will stick up there. Um, based on the World Christian Encyclopedia. And uh, we want to continue to offer resources to you. And for those of you on campus, we have uh, a, a beautiful library over in the library building, if you haven't seen it. And um, we're excited uh, to be here, excited to offer these kinds of resources, uh, and we're going to continue to do so. So the Lord bless you, and uh, hope to see you around. Thank you so much for coming.